Ariye Bafit. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kobani. I'm going to be taking care of the tech side and uh, the moderation of this conversation. Today at the Department of Anthropology and Development Studies at the University of Johannesburg, in partnership with Gauteng Anthropology, so that's the University of Johannesburg, WIDS, UNISA, University of Pretoria and Northwest, we are pleased to host today two amazing young attorneys, um, Ms. Tandega Kati and Mr. Stanley Malimaja, um, who are going to be talking to us about issues of relation to the criminalization of poverty as well as the limitations of rights and protest law. I think in anthropology, a lot of the time, we have so many conversations around structural violence, economic violence, but I think we often lack um, sort of um, the perspectives of people who are actually practicing. And that's why I think today we're so honored um, to have these two attorneys. Um, just to introduce them, um, Stanley is an admitted attorney of the High Court and works as an attorney at the Right to Protest Project. That's based at the Center for Applied Legal Studies, CALS, at uh, Wits University. He holds a master's degree in law from the University of Pretoria, so that's an LM. And he is a session sessional lecturer in jurisprudence at Wits. He was one of the two, he was one of the Mail and Guardian's top 200 young South Africans last year, so that's 2020, and is a steering committee member of the Human Rights Defenders Network. So can I just ask we all unmute ourselves and say shine to Stanley? Shine. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and then uh, Ms. Tande Gakati is a human rights attorney. She is a master's candidate in international human rights law at Oxford University. She has worked extensively in human rights law, focusing on mitigating the disproportionate impact of mining in communities hosting mining companies. She has a deep interest in the protection of social movements, environmental law, as well as the relationship between race gender, and the environment. Fantastic. Halala. Okay. Um, I think uh, Tadega is having some... Okay, she's back. Um, she was disconnected for a, a while. So Tadega will go first. And then um, Stanley will go after, and then hopefully we'll have a really productive and wonderful um, discussion. Okay, um, Tanda, over to you. Uh, Tandega? Uh, Tandega, are you there? Your screen is moving, but we can't hear you. Let me try phone here quickly because she's online on WhatsApp. Okay. Um, uh, no, no, she's unmuted. Uh, TK? Okay, uh, sorry for that technical difficulty, but I see she's moving the screen. Um, so I'm not quite sure what's happening. Tanega, are you there? Okay, uh, Stanley, do you mind going first? And then I will sort out the tech um, whilst you are talking um, in the meantime with Tanega. Is that fine? Okay, sure. Um, I'll go first uh, since uh, my colleague is having some connection difficulties. Can everybody hear me? Out and clear. Sure, we can hear. Oh, oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. So, um, thank you for the halalas. Um, thank you. That's uh, very much appreciated. You, it's it's not often where you get um, such a welcoming um, audience. So um, as already mentioned uh, by our lovely moderator, my name is Stanley Malamata and I'm an attorney at the Right to Protest Project. 
So before I can just start with my um, important contact, um, I would like first to introduce uh, the project uh, which I work for, which is the Right to Protest project. And it is uh, basically a coalition of uh, several civil society organizations, uh, which focuses on the promotion and the, advance, and the advancement of the constitutional right to protest. The project is run by two staff members, myself, the attorney, and the project coordinator. So basically the project coordinator coordinates through the coalition and referral networks nationally. <clears throat> the project um, focusing on the constitutional right to protest um, operates um, a national um, hotline, a free toll hotline, where everyone in the corners of the Republic uh, can, be, uh, can phone us and uh, you know, get um, information, legal assistance, legal advice, uh, and workshops um, in relation to the uh, constitutional right uh, to protest. So yeah, I mean, just two staff members, uh, but we serve the, uh, the whole country and we do that uh, through our member organizations uh, such as uh, CALS, the Right to Know Campaign, Lawyers for Human Rights, um, SERI, and the Freedom of Expression um, Institute, uh, FXI. So, Colleagues, I'm going to be taking you through um, basically a, a, a five a five stage uh, presentation. I'm going to, in no particular order, I'm going to be talking about what is protest, why do people protest, what regulates protests, and I'm going to also include um, a number of case studies which I have personally worked on. Then in those case studies, I'm going to identify the issues um, which face um, pro the, the constitutional right to protest and protesters um, in general. Then at the end, I'm going to give um, some recommendations and those recommendations are, uh, um, you know, are just, just, just clearly um, uh, uh, meant uh, for, you know, our, our government, our state, how best can we deal with uh, the constitutional right to protest and how can we respect our protesters? Now, a protest uh, to begin with, um, it is a constitutionally uh, protected right. It is enshrined in section 17 of the constitution and section 17 of the constitution requires us to be peaceful and to be unarmed when exercising our right to protest. The right is also internationally recognized and protected. It is further regulated by the regulations of the Gatherings Act 205 of 1993, what uh, we normally call the RGA. And this act actually speaks about the role players. It talks about the do's and don'ts during protest and how does one um, you know, go about uh, protesting. And we'll see some, uh, I'll make uh, some reference to certain uh, provisions of the regulations of the Gatherings Act. What I would like to mention that I think it's highly important is that the purpose of the regulations of the Gatherings Act is to ensure that people protest freely in public and most importantly, they are entitled to the protection of the state during a protest. Now that is the long title or rather the preamble of the uh, regulations of the Gatherings Act to ensure that each and every protester enjoys the protection of the state. Uh, but with the case studies that I'll be discussing with you, you will see that it's actually the other way around, where um, protesters often fell victim to state oppression, state brutality, you know, arbitrary um, 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 convictions, and, you know, just, just being exposed, uh, you know, to the robust um, criminal justice system. Now, it is important uh, to note that when you want to exercise your constitutional right to protest as a convener, you have a duty in terms of the provisions of Section 3 of the Regulations of the Gatherings Act, the RGA, which requires you to give notice in writing seven days before the intended date of the protest. And where you fail to give notice seven days before the intended date of the protest, you can give your notice no less than 48 hours, then you must provide reasons why you failed to comply with the seven days notification period. Now, the nature of protest uh, basically is to disturb, to challenge, or to support the status quo. 
That's why people uh, protest. So I like the phrase that the constitutional right to protest is a right to fight for a right. People protest because they want to enforce other fundamental human rights. Now, protest is also a seeking accountability, especially from those in power. Now, although protest is a right, it must be exercised, uh, you know, uh, in, in most cases in South Africa, you'll see from the case studies, it is not exercised, uh, you know, as the constitution, you know, um, envisaged. It is, um, it can easily be stifled through criminalization, police brutality and court interdicts. So basically the constitutional right to protest, um, as we see right now, it is, you know, it is more like, um, it is trending on a very thin rope where any mistake protesters can fall victim to, you know, um, state repression. Now I spoke about the importance of giving a notice, right? Now I want to clear some air. Giving a notice, it, it is an administrative issue, which is very important because it allows the state, especially the police and the Metropolis Department and other departments to be able to put measures in place to safeguard the interest and the safety of protesters. That is what um, a notice is meant for. It is an administrative issue. Now we need to remember that uh, from the landmark judgment of the Mlungwana, the Constitutional Court judgment, um, commonly known as the SJC 10 case. Now, the important thing about this case is that what the court found is that the failure to give notice in terms of the provisions is not a criminal offense. Therefore, section 12, subsection 1, paragraph A of the Regulations of the Gatherings Act, which permitted criminal punishment against the convener for failure to give notice is declared unconstitutional. Now, what we need to remember is that the Constitutional Court did not exempt people from giving notice. It rather criminalized the failure. I'm sorry, it decriminalized the failure to give notice. Now, although failure to give notice is not a criminal offense, that means you are still required to give notice because the court did not exempt people from, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, from not complying with, um, you know, the provisions of Section 3. Now, to make this clear, um, we have sub, uh, subsection 5, paragraph C of the Regulations of the Gatherings Act, which empowers a responsible officer to take steps to establish the identity of a convener who has not given notice and require him or her to comply with the notification procedure. So I think there we are clear that although failure to give notice is a criminal offense, you are not exempt from giving notice. And it is, it is actually advisable that you give uh, notice so that um, safety measures may be put in place, um, you know, so that, uh, you know, uh, and the safety of the protesters and the safety of the society at large uh, can be protest, uh, protected. Now, as R2P, we are not blind to the fact that there are certain municipal practices which make it difficult for conveners to comply with the notification period. Um, there's an op-ed which I wrote and, and, and published with, uh, with uh, the Daily Maverick and, um, and Ground Up. It was first uh, picked by Ground Up. It's, a, it's, a, it's an op-ed of 7 April 2021. So basically, they, I talk about municipalities creating arbitrary and unconstitutional requirements for permission to protest. So, oh, you, you know, although I'm ad advocating for people to give notice, um, as I said earlier, we are not blind to the fact that that notification procedure, um, uh, law enforcement authorities, responsible officers, and so forth, they take advantage of that process to, you, you know, to just to put in place um, their arbitrary requirements. Um, some of the arbitrary requirements, if I can talk to in, in, in uh, for example, in the uh, the local municipality of uh, Newcastle, is that when you want to protest, say for example, you want to come and protest against Stanley, and you've given notice, they would also require you to write a letter to me to get confirmation from me that I 
you are going to come and protest against me, which is, you know, it is arbitrary. It is against the provisions of um, the regulations of the gatherings. Act. Now, the provisions of of the regulations of the act says that if during the protest uh, one intends on submitting a petition or a memorandum of demands, what one must do is just to provide the name of the recipient of the memorandum and the place where the memorandum is going to be handed over. There's nothing in the regulations of the Gatherings Act which says that that person must first seek permission uh, from you know, the person uh, being protested against or the prospective uh, recipient of the memorandum. And this, this, it's an ongoing practice. It is not only unique, unique in Newcastle, it also happens in, 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 in Rustenburg, you know, it happens in a lot of places. Um, in the local municipality of Ekuruleni, it also happens there. And so uh, what I argue in, in, in the of ed is that such practices actually make it difficult and unbearable for people to give uh, uh, notice because they know that immediately when they give notice, then they will fall victim into this arbitrary requirements. In the city of Johannesburg, they go to an extent of saying that you need to get a confirmation letter from the ward councillor commenting on the protest. You know, so, and you know, the argument by a lot of authors is this. When rights are being transgressed, when people are not afforded access to basic services, that infringement of rights happens immediately. But here we have a law to say that, oh, if you want to challenge that, or if you want to enforce um, you know, your right to access to basic services through the constitutional right to protest, you must first give the municipality seven days. So that is, you know, the, those are the, the, that's one of the, you know, unsettling arguments regarding this notification period. But as it stands, uh, no one is exempt uh, from doing it. However, just because you are not exempt from giving a notice, it doesn't mean that if you go ahead and protest, you are wrong. Um, the constitution does recognize spontaneous protests. Sometimes the issue is so burning and it's so, you know, imminent and immediate that we can't even, you know, we just need to go to the streets and start protesting. So what are we supposed to do in such a situation? We just need to make sure that we comply with the two internal um, uh, um, qualifiers in section 17 of the constitution, which is being peaceful and being unarmed. Now, there's a lot of debates about what well, what constitutes a non-peaceful protest? Now, it, 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 with reference to, to, to um, jurisprudence and some work in, in, in Germany, um, it is argued that a non-peaceful protest is a protest which, um, you know, it has acts or threats of violence. So against a person or property. So immediately when there's an act or a threat to commit violence, uh, violence, then the protest loses the protection of the constitution. Now, when it comes to the issue of being armed, I mean, that one, it's also not a clear cut because now the regulations of the Gatherings Act will say that um, one is considered to be armed if they are carrying any dangerous weapon which um, is defined or listed in the Weapons Act. Now, there was a, a labor court case um, where the court had to decide whether the carrying of nobkiris, uh, sticks, and shambox during a protest, does that constitute from the court? Can we say that that protest is violent and therefore loses the, the, the protection of the constitution? Now, there were some interesting arguments into the, you know, it, it even jumped into customary law, where it was argued that actually the carrying of sticks, nobkiris, and shambox, those items can also be carried during celebrations. You know, uh, you know those who are familiar with uh, you know customary uh, uh, practices, you would see that um, you know during maybe the beat dance or any other you know uh, customary uh, practice, or maybe when um, 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 young boys just went through the passage of manhood and they are now coming back home. Sticks are carried. Um, not kiris are carried, jump box are carried, but it is not aimed at violence. So it is aimed, it's a, it can be a celebratory uh, um, tool as opposed to being, um, you know, a, a tool that uh, can be seen as violent. Uh, so the argument there was that, you know, it is context specific. 
just because one is carrying a note kiri doesn't necessarily that me, mean that one um, is violent or one is threatening uh, violence against a person um, or property. So, but it, it is still an, on, an ongoing, um, um, you know, argument, uh, which is, I think, um, quite interesting because we will need to be really clear about what constitutes violence and what do we mean when we say somebody is armed. Now, if we look into the state of protest in South Africa, I mean, we would all agree that protest actions played a huge role in the attainment of what we now call a democratic country. Now that we live in a liberal democratic state, one might think that ah, protest, uh, you know, one might conclude that no protest actions will diminish. <laughs> but to the contrary, protest actions continue to take place daily. In fact, in 365 days, South Africa records over 2,000 protests. It is concerning that in 365 days, in 12 months, South Africa records over 2,000 protests. Now, you know the word record is a qualifying one because it means that it is those protests maybe that were picked up by the it's those protests where notice was given. So there's database about it. What about all the other protests that just take place, you know, randomly, especially in the rural areas or in the remote areas where media coverage, you know, is not so prominent. Now, that's why, that's why South Africa, or, or rather uh, Professor um, Jane Duncan, you know, uh, uh, classified South Africa as the, you know, the protest nation. Because like the, the number of protests which we experience in this country are just uh, overwhelming. And I think it also speaks to, it speaks to the level of access to basic services. It speaks of lack of political will. It speaks to the level of uh, um, empty promises, you know. Um, protests. Protests also inform government policy and party politics manifestos. Why am I saying so? If you look at, you just take note when we when it's uh, it's voting season, right? You'd see manifestos um, saying vote for access to water, vote for electricity. It is because prior to the voting season, people have been gathering in the streets, protecting for access to basic services. So without protest, politics remain irrelevant because parties formulate their manifestos around what people need and around what people protest for. I just want to take you back uh, to a time where I think uh, all of us um, here yeah, were not born. Um, it, during the Rivonia trial, or the, not necessarily during the Rivonia trial, but in, in that era of the uh, Rivonia trial, there was a, a statement uh, made by Nelson Mandela, which I think is very important and speaks to the nature of the code. We demand universal adult franchise and we are prepared to exert economic pressure to attain our demands. And we will launch defiance campaigns and stay at homes either singly or together until the government should say, gentlemen, we cannot have the state of affairs, laws being defied and the whole situation created by stay at homes. Let's talk. That is the importance of protest. Protests are there to put pressure on the economy, on the proper functioning of the country. They are there to put pressure until the government says, we cannot have this continue. Let's talk. Unfortunately, um, the now government, um, I mean, this government is the same government that used a uh, protest um, as, as a method of taking, you know, taking power. So they know how to contain protests. They know how to stifle them. So nowadays when people protest and they exert pressure, right, or either on the economy or on the proper functioning of the country, um, you would have seen um, uh, um, uh, um, earlier, um, earlier this year um, during the fees, um, during the, another round of the fees must fall protests. 
where instead of saying we cannot have the state of affairs where black children are co continue to be excluded from academics based on uh, you know um, the protesting students uh, you know were compared to an American um, soapy you know so it, it is really it, it's really worrying it is really worrying and devastating um, to, 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 to be to, to have the concerns and the, 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 the plight and the crime of young black children be compared to an American soapy, you know? So the government of today is no longer prepared to sit down and talk. And this is why I say they are not uh, prepared to sit down and talk. They can easily stifle protests. Now, let's switch to ways which stifle protests. Um, as R2P, we have, uh, you know, we, we've recognized or, or, or rather acknowledged that there is an increase in the use of agent court interdicts as a method to stifle or to curtail or to muzzle protesters. You look at the fees must fall, the one that just happened, uh, uh, you know, recently. I was uh, assisting, um, there's, there's this, uh, um, I'm, I'm so not uh, good with um, names of uh, union uh, bodies which uh, represent um, 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 students, but the, the, I was assisting um, uh, the, 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 the university rather rent court on an agent basis um, to interdict uh, the protest. Now, here's the problem with um, such interdicts. When they are granted, they are drafted in a way that on face value, you might think that, oh no, it's a reasonable interdict. Um, the, the university is just trying to protect itself. Or, but if you look into it, it is actually aimed at muzzling the protesters. And I say this because remember earlier, I said that protests are there to apply pressure and we should never equate applying pressure and disturbing the proper functioning of an institution with violence. So as long as no element of violence is, is not found, the protest remains within the confines of section 17 of the constitution. Now, what interdicts of such nature, such as uh, the one uh, obtained by the Salt Black University, is that it makes it impossible to protest because it would say, one of the orders would say, you are not allowed or you are prohibited and interdicted from blocking the entrance of the university. You are prohibited and, 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 and interdicted from disturbing the, 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 the academic um, um, functions of the university. Can't you, what is the purpose of a protest? Isn't it that we must disturb the proper functioning of things until we are heard? So basically a protest, it says, we cannot have things continue as if it's business as normal. When you, I think we need courts which are more, you, you know, they need to be more, more, more human rights centered. We need to start asking questions of saying, when you are approaching this court at the, as the university and you are saying the protesters must be interdicted and prohibited from disturbing the academic calendar, whom are you offering these academics to? Because the same people who are protesting are the students, are the registered ones, or are the ones who want to register but are not registered. So when you are saying the academic calendar must not be disturbed, who are you offering these academics to? Because you have a list and you, you, you'd see this court interdict. It will, what they do, they go, they normally target the head. They normally target the SRC um, presidents or you know the students in the SRC structures because they know their names. They will list their names, respondent number one, two, three, four, sometimes even up to 30. Then on 31, 
they will now interdict anyone whether you are a student whether you are a parent you will for it's a blanket approach interdict it will say and any that maybe the 31st respondent will be any other person who acts in concert or who acts in collaboration with the uh, you know the 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 the, the above uh, um, listed um, 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 respondents. So it is a blanket approach. And um, this is a, a lot of institutions have, you know, found a loophole in using courts as a way of stifling protest. But it, there's an, a, a, a very, uh, um, I, I can say in my own, in my words, a lovely case, if I can put it that way. Um, the Brackenfell uh, uh, protest, I think it was last year, November. Uh, yeah, last year, November. Now, why I'm saying that this case is, is extraordinary, you'd remember that the SGB and the school ran to the courts on an urgent basis to go and stop the protest. And in that, I've, I've, I've also written an op-ed on this. You can just... Uh, I ch check it out on, 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 on the internet. I think it's also published by the, by the Daily Maverick and Ground Up. So basically why I applaud um, the court in this case is that it said it will not the agent application because the school cannot dictate where people must protest. So in essence, the court upheld the constitutional right to protest. Now, the area where the protest takes place is very significant to the protest. So if you are saying that those who have a grievance against the school must go and protest one kilometer away from the school, well, what is the essence of that protest? And, you know, this case is extraordinary in that if you look, you look into um, protests around universities, when those protests ha happen, what the university will normally tend to do is that they deploy private security who will then push out the protesting students outside the university and lock them out. Now, that causes, that is a deliberate act of causing more frustrations because the place where the protest takes place is essential to the protest. For example, if you want to protest against maybe a particular police station because they're not taking um, um, issues of gender-based violence, violence and you know issues of femicide um, seriously. Why would you go and protest at SPA? Doesn't make sense. You have to go to that police station because that is the root cause of the protest. That is the place where the protest must take place, right? Now, another example is the recent um, national um, 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 protest by uh, the Abasali, which uh, is the, the um, artists, um, you know, who were protesting up, uh, against um, uh, um, the Department of Sports and Arts and Culture for failure to pay them the relief, uh, you know, uh, the relief package. Now, what you note in that protest is that the, the protesters went and occupied the National Arts Council building and that we are not going to leave until you tell us what's happening. Because that's what protests do. We seek answers when we protest. So to run to the courts is actually a cowardice move by this institutions, uh, you know, these institutions that are being protested against. So the uh, Abbasad went and occupied the National Arts, uh, Arts Council building, and I think for a period of two weeks, and I was just, you know, monitoring it, and they would be phoning me to tell me, like, uh, what is the situation on, on the ground? I think they only vacated the building after the public protector and I think the human, uh, the human rights commission um, intervened, intervened in the matter. Um, so now with this case, what I would like to illustrate is that even in this case, the National Arts Council ran to court. And when they ran to court, the typical forms of interdict. Hey, the protesters are intimidating the staff members. Um, they've uh, broken some computers. A typical 
interdict that is aimed at Muslim protesters and running away from accountability. Again, the court dismissed this because the 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 the, the, the the Abasali, the, 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 the protesting artists, were able to say, no, 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 no. We are just occupying the building. You can come and do an inspection in local and check which computer has been broken. We haven't touched anything. We are camping here and we want answers. So now you can see that court interdicts are being used as a form to, to you know, uh, to dodge accountability. Now, another Another method of um, dodging accountability is uh, through police brutality. Is uh, through police brutality. I mean, it, it, it was said, I think uh, this year, um, I think it was in the month of March, if I'm not mistaken, um, and we had marked, um, it, no, it had marked, I think, 10 years um, since um, Andri Statani was um, killed. Uh, by police uh, during a protest. Now, you can see that with such acts, acts of, you know, acts of Andri Statan, the act of Marikana is that the state will not hesitate to take life in order to dodge accountability, in order to stifle a protest. Because it is said in the Andris Tatani case to say that a man who was protesting for access to water, a basic human right, a basic, you know, not an extraordinary, a basic human right, um, was killed. And today, Fitzbeck, the place where the protest took place, the place where there's no water, um, is still without water after 10 years. And nobody's been held accountable, either for the failure to deliver basic services, water, and for the death of Andri Statan. The police officer who fired the shot that killed Andri Statan still responds for duty. The police officer who shot and killed Andri Statan still responds to other protests. So now, lack of accountability is the one that exacerbates police brutality. And with police brutality, it is another way of muzzling protesters. It is what was done during the apartheid era, and it has continued, you know, it has continued into the democratic era. They talk about the constitution as a bridge from, you know, from the past, uh, from the apartheid to the democratic era. But what they don't tell us is that some of the behaviors, a lot of behaviors of the apartheid system, have managed to cross over this bridge with us and settle, and freely so, and undisturbed, settle in the democratic era. In Soweto, um, I, I responded to, 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 to uh, the arrest, I think it was in, I think it was, it was just before COVID. And the reason why I'm mentioning this case study, although it is a, a bit old, is that you'd notice that Soweto has, um, you know, issues with electricity and so forth. Um, so I responded to the arrest of about five people. And as I was consulting with the, with the clients, I noticed that one of the clients, a woman, she, her, her ear was swollen and, you know, it, it had black clothes. And just from the image of it, it looked very painful. So I asked her, like, what happened there? Now, this is the extent of police brutality. She was shot at point blank in the ear with a rubber bullet. Luckily, she didn't lose her life. I'm just not sure if she, she lost her sight of hearing, but at that time, um, it couldn't be confirmed. I could talk to her and she could hear me. She was shot point blank in her ear. And when she fell down, she was repeatedly the face and on that very same, you know, rubber bullet wound. She was then detained and whilst being detained, she was called names, right? She was being sworn at. She was being told this and that, this and that. And she was even denied medical attention, right? And I asked her, did they give you any treatment? She said, I was complaining the whole night. 
that my ear is painful and it continuously bled. And she wasn't lying because you could see the blood uh, clot, you know, right? So, you know, and I need to ruffle some feathers here and say that in my experience, in my line of work, police don't know how to, uh, you know, how to police gatherings in a democratic manner, in a humanely manner. Police brutality is reserved for the black people. And you see, in the context of South Africa, we are unable to, we are unable to, 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 to call it racism because it is black against black. It is a black official, a police officer or a law enforcement officer that shoots a black person. But in the context of the US, where the majority of the police officials are white, uh, you know, when such issues um, of police brutality happen, it is able to, you know, to ignite and grab the attention of the globe. But if you look into Africa, and it's not a, an issue unique to South Africa alone, you look into Africa, police brutality is reserved, uh, you know, for, for, the, for, for, for the black people. Now, another example of um, a case study. Now, this, this, all these cases that I'm talking about, um, apart uh, uh, from the Andrista Tan one, because I was still in, in my, my, my undergrad, and then my Rikita one, I was also still in my undergrad. Um, Sorry, I didn't Ken, attend. Um, just to cut you, uh, five more minutes. <laughs> Time. Five more minutes. Ah, I'm wrapping up. Let me wrap up. I'm wrapping up. Pella, if you allow me to flow, me, I'll go on. Now, also, another method um, of uh, uh, um, stifling protest, it is hiding behind the criminal justice system. So what the, what the state will do is that it will ignore protesters until it pushes them to a point of desperation where they act outside the bounds or they allegedly act outside the bounds of the constitution, right? So that when they pounce on them, when the state responds, it no longer responds in the form of, we are here to provide water, um, what can be done? This is the time periods that we need in order to address uh, your issues. When they pounce on the disgruntled and already desperate protesters, they pounce on them as criminals. So it delegitimizes the protest. So in protest, what we have seen is that um, the hiding, hiding behind the criminal justice system has in most cases converted activists into criminals, right? It also pushes for the harsh punishment of those arrested for public violence and you know, they, they love that common law offense. Public violence is number one. It will never be left out if when protesters um, um, are arrested. So it, they also push for harsh punishments, you know, against um, 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 those arrested um, during protests. You look at Ikeisagakanyatkageshe, um, you look at Kanyile's case, and now very sadly, um, the case of Lukan, who was, um, um, you know, recently um, I'm sentenced to, 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 to five years direct imprisonment. So, I mean, we, we, we have a state that is, it's, I think it's enjoying um, converting students or converting activists into criminals. Never respond. You can send memorandum of demands. It will just enter this year and come out um, this side of the, you know, year. Now, once you start being, you know, like we start developing what I would call a spirit of Google, do or die, we are going to block roads, bend tires and blah, 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 and all those things. Now, when you get arrested, best believe you me, the aim there is to convert you from an activist to a criminal so that they delegitimize your protest. Now, you hear when they talk about protest, when the state report, um, reports on protest, it, it focuses, hey, we have arrested so many, so many people for violent protests. They never tell us about why were those people protesting and what have you done apart from criminalizing them? What have you done? Does this community have water? And in my argument, I say that it seems as if the criminalization during protests, it's one-sided. Because as I mentioned earlier on, those who killed at Dristatang are still reporting for duty. Those who massacred um, the, the miners in Marikana are still responding for duty and access to basic services 
remains, you know, it, it, it remains a, a dream for a number of South Africans. So this um, act of stifling protest is just to instill fear in the protesters so that you, you know that next time if you want to protest, best know that you are trending on a very thin line and you may get arrested at any time, you may get criminalized, you may, uh, you may experience police uh, brutality. I think uh, maybe I have two minutes. Can I just wrap up with the recommendation? I'll be very- Sure, quick. no problem. Now, sure. Now, here are my recommendations. I think number one, we need a government that is concerned with the root cause of a protest. What should be, and, and also we need a government that asks itself what should be done to positively and uh, humanely and democratically respond to the grievances of protesters. Because we, in 365 days, we have over 2000 protests. Now we also need to question who must be held accountable when we, re when the, 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 the AG said that in over 200 and something local municipalities, only less than 54 got a clean audit. It means there's an issue there. There's no uh, service. There's no, uh, you know, uh, basic services are not being attended to. So who must be um, held accountable? We need also a people's government and we need a government which comprehends that protests are a method of aligning government policy and actions with the will of the people. Lastly, we need a government that does not speak about bullet trains and smart cities whilst access to basic services remains a dream and access to higher education is highly dependent on one's financial status. We need a government that respects the right to protest. Thank you. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I, I, I can't say how beautiful and layered and, and, and complex it was. There's already so many hands and um, comments uh, from the floor. But I think in the interest of time, let's first go to TK and then we'll have a discussion together um, rather than having them separately. So TK, are you able to unmute yourself? Or maybe maybe TK can come sit in my office. Yeah, I think that will work. Yes. Um, um, let okay. me come to your office then. I'm not sure. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah. We yes, can we can you. hear you now. Okay. Sure. Um, okay, I'm just you. trying to, in the meantime, to share my screen. Okay. So maybe you can take those few, maybe one or two questions while I do that. Goban. Okay, um, so there's a comment from Andile Sangwini, and I hope I pronounced it correctly, who writes that I agree that the police don't know how to handle protests in a constitutional manner, but would you say that the protesters know how to protest in such a manner that does not infringe on the rights of others? For example, uh, no damage to property or intimidation. What work are you doing to educate protesters on how not to, how to not infringe on other rights? And then I stand before you go to that one, there was a hand from, okay, I think the person has lost um, signal, both of them, they're not in the room. So um, it's okay. I think you can take that one so long. Um, hopefully yeah. they'll reconnect. Yeah, sure. No, th thank you. Thank you very much, um, Andini. That is a, a brilliant question. And I would say this, um, I would not um, pose as if, um, all the protesters know how to exercise their constitutional right without infringing on the rights of others. Um, but if you heard me in my presentation, I said that I think there is a deliberate uh, move of ignoring, of ignoring protesters until they resort to violence in order to get the attention of the state. Now, we need to acknowledge that a protest does not just start by um, um, people blocking the roads and burning tires and so forth and threatening other people. It, 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 that, is, that is a measure of last resort. These people have been trying to communicate with those who are, uh, you know, um, in power to try and address the issues. And, you know, and, and with the example also that I gave of the Minister of Education comparing the fees, the recent fees must fall to, 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 to an American soapy. I think those are other things that we must caution against to say, why is it that the state seems to be, you know, to, 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 to be 
just ignoring protesters and aggravating them. So yes, not all protesters know how to exercise their right. And that becomes a problem because what they're actually doing, they're shooting themselves in the foot because they're <coughs> illegitimizing the protest. So uh, what we are doing to educate them, um, Andy, as I said, our work also includes um, providing uh, workshops. So we go um, to communities, your most remote, remote co communities and your urban communities, and we educate them on their constitutional right to protest. And the question they, almost, they always ask, what do we do when we do not get um, answers? Then I say, look, there are other methods of protesting. You go back to the drawing board. Uh, burning a building, vandalizing a road will not, um, you know, it will not solve the issues. It will just uh, delegitimize your protest. So you go back to the drawing board. How do you best help hold people accountable? So that's what that's the education we give them. We tell them about the limitations in the constitution. We tell them about when does your protest lose protection of the constitution. That's why we always advocate that protests must be organized and there must be marshals who are looking over the crowd. If we are saying we are protesting from one to two o'clock, let it be one from to two o'clock. Uh, let us serve our memorandum of demand and let us, uh, you know, disperse peacefully. So, so that is the education that we give them. Uh, Andy. Thank you very much. For Wonderful. That um, there was a hand from Tonika, but I think let's park that until uh, after Tandega's presentation in the interest of time. But um, uh, Lulu Makolano writes that I fully agree with Stanley. It is called gaslighting in non-legal terms. And um, Andy says mm. thank you very much uh, for, the, for the comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stan, for that. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. OK. Um, a good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm so sorry about the glitch earlier uh, on. Um, uh, I was sorry, meant Tanya, to. Before you continue, yes. can you please maximize your screen and remember to click on the open book icon, not the other one? Oh, shucks. OK. Let me. At the, okay. at the bottom of your presentation. And now? So, yeah, that one. Perfect. Can you see? You. Sure, sure, yes. sure. Um, so I was meant to go first um, to sort of give the context before Stan comes in and, and with his case studies. Um, but I do hope that it will still make sense. Uh, so I will do three things in this presentation. I will briefly introduce who we are in the work that we do. Um, and then I will speak about constitutional protections against, I guess, criminalization of, of poverty. And then I will give examples of victimization. And then I will also speak slower. I realize that I'm quite nervous and I'm, yeah, let me know if you are unable to hear me. So we are public interest of human rights lawyers. I will let you know later on why I say this. Um, we, we are the Center for Applied Legal Studies, um, other, also known as KELS. Um, KELS is a registered law clinic, registered as such with the Legal Practice Council of South Africa, uh, but it was initially established as a research center um, at the law school of the Witt, of Witt University. It was established in 1978, and since then it has been one of the leading human rights research, advocacy, and strategic litigation organizations in South Africa. Um, you may ask yourself why we are speaking on these topics. I was speaking about these topics because we, um, we represent a variety of social movements grassroots organizations, as well as communities and activists and other marginalized actors. Okay, I had said previously that we are public interest lawyers. Um, public interest lawyers are different from your traditional or in inverted commas, normal lawyers, right? Uh, with normal lawyers, you would, in an accident, you walk into a lawyer's um, practice, to a law firm, you present your case, and then they open a case for you, and they bill you for that. With us, it's different. We only take on cases that are aligned to our strategic vision. Um, so unless, and we also have a vested interest in the once we take it, because remember, we only take cases that are in line with our strategic vision. So whether we lose or not later on, we have a vested interest in that. Unlike a traditional lawyer where if they get paid, they get paid, whether you win or lose, you know, it doesn't matter to them. Um, 
our vision um, as as Kelt is to is to fulfill, our vision is that of a country or continent where human rights are respected, protected, and fulfilled by the state. Just by the state, um, I think I, historically a lot of public interest litigation was the civil society organizations or public interest uh, organizations fighting the government of power right we can see especially in um in the mining sector that corporations and mining companies have sometimes more power than the government um so we also want to see a country where corporations as well as individuals who have power are also held to account um I had said that I will speak, I think Stan has done an amazing job in highlighting the issue that is faced by, sometimes when we say the poor, it's, it's, it's sometimes a, a politically incorrect term because it assumes that people woke up or they are poor by their own means, right? That, 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 that I sometimes refer to the term impoverished because it means someone made them that way, right? Um, because sometimes when you think about the poor, then you versus the poor and the, you compare the poor and the rich, right? The rich are industrious, you know, they work hard, they are the way that they are, and poor are lazy and so on and so forth. And that's not how things are in reality. In reality, people are made poor by systems. Um, so with saying that, and with speaking about the constitution, I tried to run away about speaking about the constitution, but there was no way that I could run away from it because the constitution is the supreme law of the country. And I do realize, I think from the get go, I need to acknowledge that the legitimacy of the constitution is highly debated. Um, but for purposes of this presentation, I will not be dealing with that. I think for the purposes of this presentation, we will just accept it as the supreme law of our country. Um, the amazing thing about the Constitution is before it even starts with the different section, there's a preamble to the Constitution. And the preamble sort of sets the for the entire document, right? Um, it says, we, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustices of the past. And then it goes on to say, we believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. Uh, united in our diversity. Um, we therefore, through our freely elected represent, uh, representatives, adopt this constitution as the supreme law of the republic. To do what exactly? Um, to heal the divisions of the past and to establish a society based on democratical values, social justice, and fundamental human rights, right? And the constitution is meant to lay the foundation for a democracy for, a, for an open and democratic society. And then when we move then from the preamble, we then move into the different sections of the constitution. And one of the founding values that is section one of the constitution says that the constitution is sovereign, right? It's, demo, um, oh, sorry, the South Africa, South Africa is a sovereign democratic state founded on the values of human dignity. I want you to go back to the examples that Stan gave you and then think about whether we are protecting people's human dignity. And then it also goes on to say that um, not just human dignity, but the achievement of equality and the advancement of human rights and freedom, right? Um, Stan, I think, has elaborated and showed you that not everyone is equal before the law, but everyone is meant to be. Um, and then you enter the Bill of Rights. Um, section nine, one of the Bill of Rights says, everyone is equal before the law and has the right to equal protection and benefit of the law. Um, I think using protest as an example, you have seen that already there's an issue there. And then section 10 says, everyone has an inherent dignity and the right to have the dignity uh, respected and protected. Um, <laughs> This, this this is a little bit, and I laugh because obviously, even from the examples that Stan gave and the examples that I have, I will give you later on, it will become quite apparent that not everyone has an inherent jurisdiction because, I mean, sorry, dignity, because by saying that everyone has inherent uh, dignity, you are saying that 
It's inalienable. Like there's nothing they can do to get rid of that dignity. You're born with it. You can't earn it. You know, it's yours for life. But we see that people are people's dignities are not being respected, and people are dying over you know over pro protesting for water, over asking for schools to have um, sanitized toilets. You know. Um, over asking for the bare minimum, like people are dying over that. Where is their dignity then? Um, and then we also have section 12. I'm just picking on the very famous sections of the constitution that we usually rely on, you know, that give us our dignity. Like section 12 uh, says, everyone has the right to freedom and security of person. So that right includes the right not to be deprived of, um, of your freedom, you know, without just cause. Um, you see that, especially using protest as an example, because you've just come from a talk, just then has just spoken about uh, protests. In a protest, when a protest takes place and the police come to disperse it and to arrest people, right? Um, even if you are in the vicinity of the protest, like you literally could be on your way to work and you will still get arrested as if you were part of the protest uh, because of something called common purpose. Um, so this this part of the, the constitution that says you shouldn't have your freedom, um, deprived of your freedom without just cause is, I don't wanna say laughable because I took an oath. Uh, so <laughs> let me not say that. And then uh, we move in, we move on to say that, uh, it, it goes on to say that you should be free from all forms of violence from either the public or private sources. Um, you will realize during the most recent um, protest about university fees that someone lost their lives um, in, in Bramfontein. Um, the person wasn't a student, but they were on the way from seeing a doctor, you know, and they were shot with a rubber bullet and they lost their lives just like that. And, um, and then our minister of police was asked about it um, on the news. He said something about not being sure what took place, you know, and this was like hours later. So obviously if he cared, he would have found out. So it's, it's, it's also alarming um, at how people's freedom of security really doesn't exist if you're poor or if you're fighting for something. Um, and then I go on to say that despite all these protections, the law is still utilized as a tool to further victimize marginalized people. Okay. Um, so Professor Patricia Williams in The Alchemy of Race and Rights but I guess it also falls into the criminalization of poverty through bylaws section that I'm going to speak about. She says conditions are bad. They're very bad all over the world. Um, I'm sorry, I'm here to, 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 to depress you because I'm here to give you. <laughs> I'm here to sort of highlight how things are on the ground. Um, last year, uh, if you were looking at the news or if you are aware of like things that were happening with Donald Trump, uh, the US was very angry at the UN special repertoire on poverty and, and human rights because basically in his um, report to the UN, and I think this is also true to South Africa, he noted that the state relies heavily on criminalization to conceal underlying poverty problems, right? There's certain rights in the constitution, like the right to a healthy environment in section 24, like the right to adequate housing under section 26, like um, the right to the basic rights and protection of the child, you know, under section 28, where our state or our government has incredibly failed people. Um, and in order to sometimes conceal Um, Tandeka, uh, can we just give her a few seconds? I can see she's reconnecting. Uh, you are muted, Stan. Are you talking? 
No, I'm, I'm trying to phone her, but if you're saying she's reconnecting, then that's fine. Yeah, she is. Uh, she also should be back in... In a minute, uh, let's just give her a second. Um, yes, sorry. Um, so, <laughs> Subani? Okay, welcome back. Sorry, hi, you disconnected for a little bit, but we can we can hear you now. Oh, and where did I disconnect? Uh, right around where you were talking about the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Yes, so the Special Rapporteur has had said that um, the United States sometimes, and, and I think this is true to South Africa and other countries as well, that's why I'm using this example here, say that, um, that, that, that they rely heavily on criminalization in order to conceal underlying poverty problems, right? Um, he noted that cities in the United States, um, in many cities in the United States, people were effectively being punished uh, for conditions that they found themselves in. Um, I think this is very important, even in our context, because did what did did did, did you hear me when I spoke about the different rights in the constitution that are being violated? Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So then I'll go on, um, and then he sort of pointed out that in the United States, people get you know they get arrested for sleeping in open air spaces in urinating in public spaces even though the government does not adequately provide them with housing and public to and public toilets um why did i use this example i use this example because it's also true to south africa um i think the worst thing that can happen to you in south africa is to become homeless and we know that it's very easy to become homeless um, you just look at the number of people who are unemployed. Uh, you look at the number of people who, who have job insecurity. And you know that everyone is just one salary away from poverty. So homelessness can happen to anyone. But then if you do find yourself um, homeless in South Africa, then you are about to face an uphill a battle, right? Uh, so the Johannesburg um, Open Spaces Bylaws, they prohibit or they... Uh, they prohibit um, conduct which contravenes uh, provision, which contravenes the provisions, and conduct which causes nuisance. Now, nuisance is a very, very um, difficult thing that we still have it in our law, especially in a constitutional uh, democracy, because nuisance basically means that um, unlawful annoyance and inconveniences to another person. So let's say you live in a particular suburb and you're not allowed to um, to, to make noise after certain hours. Then the police can be called to come to your place. And what usually happens is that the police come and they make you sign something called uh, an admission of guilt. And you are happy, you sign it, you're not going to go to jail. But you're not knowing that what has happened is that you've signed an admission of guilt and now you have a criminal record and that's going to affect, to affect your life going forward. Um, so this Johannesburg bylaw, what it does is also uh, prohibits causing nuisance. Um, so it also goes on to say that it prohibits uh, camping or residing in an open space. Now, who camps and resides in, a ho in an open space? Obviously, those who don't have homes. They are the ones who do that. Um, and then it also says failure to adhere to these laws um, will result in a fine. So where are you going to get money from? You're already home on the street. So a fine or a maximum of six months imprisonment. So imagine being imprisoned for being a, nuis a nuisance and being imprisoned for being homeless. And then you will think, no, that's just the city of Johannesburg. And then you go on to the city of Cape Town. Uh, the city of Cape Town also has similar provisions uh, where they prohibit um, behavior, including starting or keeping a fire. Now, if you've been in Cape Town over winter, you know how cold Cape Town is. And sleeping overnight um, or erecting any shelter except for uh, cultural initiation ceremonies or informal settlements. So it means that as a homeless person in Cape Town, if you start a fire, 
you know, if you erect some form of shelter, then you are at risk of, uh, pro of, of contravening this bylaws and may face a fine or imprisonment. Yeah, it's it, it, it's actually it's you find this provision in most of the 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 metros across South Africa because even in the city of um, Eteguini, they are even more vile because they say that any person who is convicted of any offense under the bylaws, nuisance being one of the offenses, is liable to a fine of an amount not exceeding forty thousand rands. Okay, so you're sleeping on the streets because you're homeless. And now you're supposed to somehow pay the government or the state 40,000 rands. Where is that going to come from? People who work can't even afford to have savings worth 40,000 rands. Um, if you are unable to pay this amount, then you risk imprisonment for a period of two years. Um, or, both, uh, or you have to, to pay both the fine and the risk being imprisoned. Right? This is just the the criminalization of being homeless is just but one example right of the criminalization of poverty um there's many examples um before i go on um i'd like to highlight that women non binary persons as well as people in, as well as lgbtqia plus people are often um often experience burdens of poverty in a particularly harsh way right with multiple violations um, for example, through the criminalization of sex work, uh, incurring criminal records through illegal informal trade, right, such as running sheep beans without licenses. Um, you would know that in the township, a lot of people run sheep beans without licenses because that's just the way that they are. You know, I'm not okaying or excusing it, but that's just the way that people are trying to live, you know, in a country where we have such a high unemployment rate. Um, I won't go further into the use of interdicts and police brutality uh, because I think Stan touched on that. Um, and then there's also something that has come from um, America. So in the world of globalization, a lot of international um, companies are now coming to South Africa, right? And with that, they are bringing with them um, a lot of new and creative ways to sort of tremble on our constitution. Um, and one of these ways is something called a slap suit. Um, a slap suit is, uh, is an acronym for strategic litigation against public participation. Uh, we have seen it more especially in mining communities. So a lot of these international companies can be found in mining communities. Uh, so what does this mean? Um, a strategic litigation against public participation is basically the use of litigation uh, to silence activism. So you would know, or a company would know that uh, they, you would say something negative about a company in a public space. Of course, you're an activist, you know, that's your job, you should agitate. Um, you say something negative about a company in a public space, and before you know it, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a defamation uh, claim against you, or they launch a, a defamation claim against you, and uh, they'll obviously start with a letter of demand and ask you to apologize. Why would you apologize for something that you believe is true? Ask apologize, and so obviously you won't apologize. And then they will then institute litigation against you, knowing very well that the, 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 the claim is meritless, you know? They're only instituting litigation in order to discourage you or to make an example out of you, because legal costs are very expensive. Um, and so they try to make an example out of you to make sure that other people in the future who try to speak negatively against this company uh, will be dissuaded from doing so. So this is the way that they are sort of curbing or silencing activism. Um, it's, it's important to know that in the countries where these this, 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 this companies come from, um, there are laws in place called anti-slap laws where you can then as a defense say when you receive papers or these things you can say wait this is a slap suit and then a, co a court will hear that out in south africa we don't have that 
um, and it's very concerning because we see a lot of a rise in slap suits, especially when, when Stan was talking about the use of interdicts. Like interdicts can also be used as a slap as slap as, as, as slap as slap suit against activists. So in South Africa, as it stands, the legislature has not done anything um, to protect activists. Um, another place where campaign on Twitter, uh, where people were coming out and they were naming people who had violated them. And in that week, there was a rise in, um, in, in, in the perpetrators or the alleged perpetrators then serving people with, um, with court papers or asking them to, to apologize in order not to be taken to court. So you can see that this is manipulating the system, right? Um, it's an abuse of court process, essentially. Um, and then I was going to stop here, and I don't have any solutions for you right now. <laughs> I was just here to highlight the issues. Um, so yeah, thank you. Ah, oh, fantastic. Fantastic. We are being fed. <laughs> and I just, as I listen to this, I'm, I'm thinking it is such a useful teaching resource um, to actually hear the legal perspective on all of these issues that we often talk about um, in anthropology. So without a wasting any more time, um, if anyone in the, amongst the participants has a comment, I saw um, Andile's question. Okay, um, Andile asks, out of curiosity, and I guess this goes to both of you, um, in your experience, how often do protesters um, approach the courts to enforce their rights? For example, um, issues relating to retrenchment, service delivery, et cetera, before taking to the streets. But before we go to that question, um, just to allow you time to think about it, does anyone in the room um, have any other question? Um, if you do, please, because we um, it's small participants now, I think people have left, but uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and. Um, Go ahead. But otherwise, if not, then we can go to um, Stanley and Tadeva for reflections. Okay. Should, should I go first in responding that question? Sure. Uh, you can. Yeah. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Andile, for, for, the, for the question. Wandile had a jump out quickly for a meeting. So, um, so here's the thing. Um, it is not often where people um, approach um, the, the courts, um, especially protesters, in order to enforce their rights. Um, we need to acknowledge that although everyone has the right to access to courts, litigation is costly, as Tandega has mentioned. Litigation is, co uh, is costly. Um, imagine not having water, not like uh, the, I'll give you a practical example, in the, in the Eastern Cape, in a, a village called uh, Bizana. They've never seen a tap of running water, those people. They don't know what a tap of running water looks like. They've been fetching water from uh, man-made wells and so forth. Now, if those people can't even afford like to buy water uh, and they're in secluded areas, and so their access to, you know, courts becomes highly, highly limited. And also another thing is that um, we work more with we uh, people who um, know that courts are not only courts is not uh, the, the only way to enforce your rights and that protests are for them the most effective and the most immediate way of enforcing their rights. We have a number of um, 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 people um, or even um, organizations of our likes like the, like section 27 uh, you know who has approached uh, court on the Michael Komape case, right? And has, uh, you know, got a court order against uh, the, 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 the education department in Limpopo. And still that court order, you know, the, 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 the government is, is just not, you know, taking court orders seriously. So it also, people are discouraged, um, you know, to approach the courts because court orders are not being taken seriously. With um, another example that um, um, Kels um, is working on, um, there's a case in a uh, Sikukuni, where we have a court order against uh, the municipality of Sikukuni to provide people with water. They're just not taking that court order seriously. 
And now people, we, we consulted with that community and they said, look, we don't think that the courts are working for us. Because here yeah, we have a paper. This paper says that these people must provide us with water. They're not providing water, but the mayor and the minister, they, they're still sitting in the office and nothing is happening. So we want to take to the street. We want to challenge and disturb the status quo. Maybe that's the only way we, you know, we'll get uh, answers. So yeah, people to court, but I, I think slowly but surely, um, activists are losing faith in in the courts because government is just not implementing those orders. Thanks, Stan. And to just add on to what Stan has said is um, a lot, not only is litigation costly and sometimes judgments are not, uh, you know, implemented, um, but sometimes advocacy is a far more powerful tool than litigation. Um, and also, yeah, like, and also note that before people protest, like they usually write to the municipality. There's a lot of steps that take place before they protest. Um, and even then they are ignored. So even protest itself is usually a measure of last resort. And when you take a matter to court, you have to show to the judge or you have to show to the magistrate that you have done everything possible to come to a resolution before approaching the court or else you risk your matter being thrown out of court and then incurring more costs. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll still open up um, if anyone still uh, has anything to ask. Please feel free to just um, unmute yourself. Um, Jabu, I see your question. Do you want to unmute yourself and, and, and speak through it or should should I read it for you? Um, I, can, I can talk to it. Uh, I think it's highlighted number one by, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Jabu, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, the question is, is 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 highlighted number one by the demand um, for 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 your services, and I think TK has been mentioning quite a, a few times that litigation is very expensive. So the basis of the question is, what challenges are you guys facing in 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 providing the services which are highly in demand? And number two, uh, on the aspects of funding. Um, since it's so expensive for, for, for your services, and I believe litigation, because in, inevitably it probably leads to litigation for you guys to enforce the rights of, of, of poor communities or impoverished communities. How, how are you uh, dealing with, 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 the, with the issues of funding? And, and I, think, I think the backdrop to that question is whoever funds you, um, would, are there no conflicts um, in, terms, in terms of you ensuring that uh, that the public interest is 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 upheld. Thank you. Um, can I can I go first, Dan? Um, I think one of the main issues that we face is that public interest organisations are only in the main cities, right? Uh, they are in Johannesburg, Pretoria, Durban, and yeah, like I think I can't think of a public interest especially public interest law organizations that, that are outside of the main cities. And whereas on the ground, a lot of violations occur in the rural areas, you know, a lot of violations occur in the small towns. So that's one of the, our biggest challenges is that in order for you, if you are some and something happens, like a mining company comes into your community and does what mining companies do, uh, you would have to then come to Johannesburg or you would then have to call us or email us. And then because there's so much demand, sometimes we don't have capacity to take on a case, even though a case has merit. Um, so that's the first one. There's just not enough hands. Um, in terms of, um, of, 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 um, Sorry, now I've lost my train of thought. In terms of challenges, uh, the second challenge that we really we face is funding. Uh, we are donor funded. Um, so even if we see that a case is great, if there's no money to take it on, then we can't take it on. Even if it aligns with our strategic vision, we still can't take it on. And then I think personally for me, um, one of the challenges that I face is that I'm a you know, I'm very closely linked to the issues that I litigate over. 
Um, so that is also a risk to your mental health um, because you come from those communities that don't have water, you know? You come from those communities. So you and the client are one person. So unlike in traditional law firms where a person can sort of distance themselves from the issues, you don't have that luxury. So yeah. Stan? Yes. Thanks, Tandega. I, I, I think, uh, Tandega, you uh, covered uh, most of iterate. Um, it's not a lot of us who are vested into uh, human rights lawyering, and obviously there's a shortage of um, you know organizations um, of our kind. So that is actually it, it is really challenging. And I think uh, for for me uh, personally, well, well, what's also challenging is that um, I, I am the, the, the only attorney who primarily focuses on the constitutional right to protest. So being, you, you know, being in different areas um, and just listening to the same problems, because I can tell you the problem that they are experiencing in Palabo in relation to the mine is the same problem that is being faced in Kolobin. You know, just look at the distance between Palabo and Popo and the Eastern Cape, right? So for, for me, it, it, it's also mentally draining um, to see like, you know, people in, in, in different uh, corners of the Republic um, struggling uh, with the same thing. And, you know, of course, also the, the issue of, uh, you know, funding can, can, can also be um, 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 burdensome, especially on the, on, on the mental state of, of, of uh, us as human rights lawyers. I mean, Tandega and I have stories where because of funding and we know that the people who we are going to attend to, you know, are, you know, impoverished, you know, they're the most marginalized. Sometimes you get to a place where you've been booked in into a lodge where you, just sleeping is unbearable, you know. You remember that the, the bed bugs uh, story, Tandega? Where we got bitten by bugs because we were sleeping at some joint. Rest, <laughs> rest, 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 rest. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's also some, just to highlight, or that there's just, you know, before we can even deal with the case. Um, so sometimes we have to, you know, prepare, imagine preparing yourself for a five hours trip in, in, in 30 minutes. You know, those are the things that uh, we deal with, but because we are devoted. Uh, you know, to, to, to human rights, and, and that, that's why we do what we do. But um, really, we just need a lot of organizations, especially in marginalized um, communities. You know, there isn't a public interest litigation organization in Pumalanga, Limpopo, Northwest. So you can just imagine. Ah, oh, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, um, colleagues, let's take one last round if anyone has a last burning comment and then um, Stanley and Tandega can um, close us off because we don't want to tax you too much <laughs> after, particularly after sharing uh, the nuances around the difficulties of your work. So um, if there's anyone in the room with a, with a burning comment, uh, feel free to just um, unmute yourself. Um, Otherwise, I'm going to just ask um, Tandega, Kati, and Stanley to, to close us off. Okay, Jabu is unmuted. Um, I, I think, I think for, for one, I just want to commend you guys for, for the work you're doing um, and for facilitating this discussion today. It is very, 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 very mind opening. Um, I think some of us are not in the human rights space and we tend to sometimes be disassociated with the struggles of our people um, and, and, and face those or be reminded of those realities when they hit close to home. Like Tandega said, some of us are from uh, communities where these things are our daily bread. So I think I commend you guys for the work. And I, as, as, as much as I'm not in the human rights space, I would be interested in knowing how can we help or how can we assist um, uh, your cause because it is a just cause. And as you I, I mentioned, there are few challenges that you guys are facing. So maybe in, in, in your closing, you can maybe give us some things to think about as to how we can assist you 
um, funding alone might not be the solution. Uh, but maybe, yeah, let me, let me wait and hear what you guys have to say. Thank you. Do you want to go first? Okay, sure. Let me let me go. Yeah, I can go. No, uh, Jabu, thank thank you very much. And um, I think for me, this is um, what can assist. <laughs> Knowing Jabu personally, uh, he's he's also an admitted attorney, and I know that he also runs um, a private practice. And you know what, I want to say this, and but I want to say it with caution, uh, because I understand that running a private practice, especially as a young black man, um, it is not fun in games. Um, you also have other responsibilities to try and put uh, bread on the table. Therefore, with that being said, it sort of like cuts away your, your, your passion or your, the time that you can give uh, to pro bono uh, you know, services. Uh, but I what I would like to request is that, um, you know, uh, private attorneys, um, you know, just make some time. Um, represent one or two protesters. I mean, we, we come from townships, we come from areas where protests happen every day, and you'd see people getting protested. And in court, you know, uh, they often sometimes do not have legal representation. I know, although legal aid is there, and legal aid is doing some great work, I don't want to lie on that, but I would also appreciate it if um, you know uh, private attorneys can also you know just jump into the uh, to the pool and, and invest um, into some 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 pro bono work um, as well. And also with this, I um, mean the information that uh, we we've given you today, um, it is quite um, you know you know the information that we've given you today. If you have some time um, in your community, do spread it around. Do educate people about the do's and don'ts of protests. And um, yes, as I said earlier, when they are in need of legal assistance or legal advice, um, sometimes try to do it pro bono, although I know that it can be uh, financially burdensome, especially if you're running um, um, you know, a private law firm. But at least just do try and give people some pro bono um, services. Thank you so much, Stan. Um, and thank you, Jabu, for that very thought-provoking question. Um, I guess one of the ways, as we've been saying in this presentation, you know, litigation is but one tool, you know, and not everyone can litigate. So we are not asking for that. We are asking that a number of you here write, you know, on, 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 on issues where you're experts in, but you can write an op-ed, you know, those who write about issues continue writing about this because I found that there's a there's a very anti-poor public narrative, right? So even in dinner parties with your friends, you know, say something. Um, so yeah, and then also, I don't want to be this person, but Kels has a donate button on our website. We have a donate button on our website, and you can give as little as five friends, I think, um, just to further just to further the cause, uh, because we do represent like a lot of communities as we've as we've highlighted, you know, like demand supply demand far ex, uh, far exceeds supply. There just isn't enough of us, and one of the reasons why that is so is because there isn't enough funding. Thanks. Lovely, lovely. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know. Do you have any last but um, closing comments, um, Stanley and and and, and Tandega before we, before we close? Beyond what has already been asked. Yeah. No. I th I think um, in closing, thank you very much uh, for um, organizing this platform. Um, big ups to my alma mater, UJ, <laughs> for giving uh, me this platform. You know, to talk about. Um, um, burning issues that are facing um, our people. And thank you to everyone who came, who logged in, used your data and listened to us. Um, you know, thank you for the wonderful questions, thought provoking, some of them challenging. Um, yeah, and uh, we hope that uh, we've, we've done justice to this session. And I mean, uh, we thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. I couldn't have done anything better unless if there was someone who was arrested. 
um, a process that was arrested and I needed to run for pay. Uh, but um, thank you very much for organizing this, Kambela. Uh, we really, really, really appreciate uh, your time and organizing the content in Jeone World. And thank you for that, um, that poster. That poster is fire. Thank you very much. <laughs> No, um, thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Kambela, for inviting us. Um, and thank you to everyone who has not just only shown up, but like shown up and engaged with us on Saturday. TK, are you there? Okay, we lost TK at the end, but I think we all got the essence of what um, she was trying to say. And I think uh, both Suhle and Lulu's um, comments um, certainly sum it up, that thank you so much. We've really been thoroughly educated. Suhle says, thank you everyone, and thank you for the work you do. And I, I can't think of a better way to close. So thank you so much, um, Stanley, and thank you so much to Tandega, and we do put these videos up on YouTube and we found about four times um, the number of people who attend watch. So they will still be a resource. And like I said, I'm go definitely going to use this in my teaching. So this will reach hundreds um, and hundreds of students. So um, please continue with the good work. We're very proud of you and you make us proud to spell our names, black joy, excellence, black joy, happiness, black joy, everything.